So just to set the scene, in part one, Katie and I talked about how to hire the right people at the right time for the right roles and in a way that, that does foster longer term uh, staff retention. But this one's going to be really about once you've hired the person, what plan do you have in place to maximize trainer retention and the value that they bring to the business? The tricky part of running a fitness business is we started these things because we're passionate about movement, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to lead people and how to train people and get them to stick with us. So we really need to think about the upfront work, what it's going to take to train the person for the job itself. And it's not just say one day, here's the fire extinguisher, here's the leg press, this is what we do, and here's a program, go. It really should be about at least a four or so week onboarding to get them involved in your culture, recognize that they need to understand who your clientele is, who your fellow staff people are, who you are as a leader. Keep checking in. That's the really important thing to focus on to start with. Lauren Snow here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for growing your business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. Before we dive into today's episode, please grab your free PDF playbook, Referral Machine, a four-step referral blueprint for your hit business. You can download that now at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, the short for referrals, just R-E-F. You'll also get a four-length video training with Discover Strength's Luke Carlson on exactly how they drive referrals at Discover Strength. Just go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref to download that now. This is episode 472. <laughs> I had to check that then. And today's guest is returning for a part two, Katie Santos. And for those that aren't familiar, Katie is the founder of Katie Santos Consulting and Fitness HR, fitnesshr.com. An internationally, she's an internationally recognized movement teacher with 40 years in the fitness and wellness industry. Uh, pursuing a human resource certification allowed Katie to focus on helping studios comply with recent employment law changes nationwide. Katie's knowledge of the unique nature of the fitness and wellness industry needs related to employees allows her to be their partner and advocate as they navigate the new law changes. And Katie is focused on helping businesses and people become their best selves. With the power of Evernote and other proven strategies, she encourages business leaders to organize and leverage their big ideas with simple solutions to concentrate on success. I uh, haven't had many people on the podcast before, like Katie, who have a strong understanding of HR and HR law as it relates to building a fitness business. So excited again to have Katie on the podcast and go through uh, more uh, employee related stuff together. So just to set the scene um, in part one, which was episode 469. Uh, Katie and I talked about how to hire the right people at the right time for the right roles and in a way that that does foster longer term uh, staff retention. But this one's going to be really about, you know, once you've hired the person and obviously getting that hire right is super important. What plan do you have in place to maximize trainer retention and the value that they bring to the business? That's what we're going to be exploring today. Is that right, Katie? That's right. That's right. I'm glad to be back, Lars, for having me. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a long, drawn-out intro. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. It's good to see you. So, where should we start? Uh, you you dropped me a few really helpful bullets. Uh, one of the one of the main sort of statements is training, engaging staff for the long term, staff that do what you expect them to do and bring value to your business. So, do you want to just kick off there? Sure, sure. Yeah. You know the the tricky part of running a fitness business is we started these things because we're passionate about movement, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to lead people and how to train people and get them to stick with us. So I want to touch on that today a little bit. And first off, I want to say, you know, don't be afraid to be the leader in your business. And that means, you know, you've done the hard work to find someone to come on board with you. You think you've hired the right person. We can't just drop them in to the job and hope for the best, right? We have to be able to turn inward and think about leading them and coaching them throughout the whole time they're with us, right? And oftentimes I, I turn to people and ask them to think about how they lead their clients and how confident they are about the work that they do with their clients and how they're confident in leading them and telling them what to do and having them establish goals and, and that sort of thing. It's really no different when we talk to our employees. So we really need to think about the upfront work, 
what it's going to take to train the person for the job itself. And it's not just a one day, here's the fire extinguisher, here's the leg press, this is what we do, and here's a program, go. It really should be about, I feel, at least a four or so week onboarding to get them involved in your culture, to recognize that they need to understand who your clientele is, who your fellow staff people are, who you are as a leader, and to keep checking in. So I think that's the really important thing to focus on to start with. Okay. Um, so yeah, carry on from there, really. And so how do you go about, I guess, building out that process for new trainers and new, new staff? So if you've got an existing staff already, it's important to involve them, I think, and, and sit them down and say, okay, if, if you were going to start here today, let's think about day by day for the first four weeks. What does it look like? to onboard you in a way that makes you feel comfortable. Um, I've told a story before about walking into a party and having no idea how to dress or what the party's about. It's similar here. So we want to think about exactly what do we want our trainers to know so that they can be really successful. We don't want them to feel like they need to hide in a corner somewhere because they are not quite sure what to do in their roles, right? So it's a, important to establish a really good job description, which hopefully, if you've listened to our other podcasts, we, we talked about how to do that. And from there going, okay, I need my staff to know how to run the computer, how to um, manipulate all the equipment, like I said, how to run the culture, and divide that into daily tasks that the new trainer needs to be involved with to learn how to do their role. Once that initial period is over with, it doesn't stop, right? We should, as leaders, be able to carve out about one hour a week to go around to each staff member and just check in with them. And that includes the high performers and especially the underperformers. We don't want the high performers to feel like they're ignored. And we don't want those lower performers to feel like they can hide out and get away with whatever it is that they're getting away with. And I know speaking from experience in coaching my clients, they don't like to be a leader. They're afraid of it. They want to be a friend to the people on their staff. They don't know how to be a leader. And it really isn't that difficult in that you just have to think about, excuse me, as I approach this trainer, what do I need to focus on? What, how am I looking at their work? Not them necessarily as a personality or an individual, but look at how they're working and be able to coach them to improve that work that they're doing with the client. Is it that they didn't close a sale? Is it that they didn't match up with the stated client goal? Is it that the program that they offered them wasn't appropriate for the client? So start to really look at how they're working and coach them, not necessarily correct them, but coach them through how to do those things correctly, right? Um, the other thing is, is you want to learn to be a good manager. We talked about it before. It's like learning to do leg press correctly and making sure your alignment's right, right? It takes practice and it takes repetition. And the best managers are those who are willing to learn the techniques and calendar them and do them repeatedly until they become skills and continue practicing them until they become habits, right? Mm. Great start. So, um, yeah, just to dig into this first four weeks in a little bit more detail. So um, just to, again, set the scene, I guess, for my audience who are running high intensity training businesses. To, to my mind, the main things that are gonna that a new trainer is gonna need to be able to do or understand in those first four weeks is gonna primarily be, you know, obviously working with clients in a one-on-one -on -one context and designing programs tailored to those clients. Uh, obviously, again, this is focused around strength training, right? Um, in our, in our niche and understanding how to um, how to set each one of those machines for that client, how to, and probably one of the most important things is how to coach that client through that set really productively 
how to get the most out of them, how to deliver a great overall workout experience. And then related to that is customer service, like how to talk to a client and maybe the specific language that you use um, and how you treat the client overall through their, throughout their workout and maybe outside the workout in communications as well. Uh, and then you were mentioned there about, you know, how do you use software? How do you use any, you know, any software packages or uh, tablets or whatever it is that you might have in your business, how to operate those effectively. Um, trying to think what else there might be, maybe other, uh, other meetings, um, or, or more, sorry, to take a step back, understanding the kind of management process. So like, if you have like a weekly meeting, for example, um, understanding how that all works. So those are some of the things that first come to mind for me in terms of what a new trainer is going to have to understand and, and get good at. And I know, I know a lot of, um, listeners will need trainers to be ready to take clients within maybe. I don't know, like as soon as one month. And um, I think that's harder in our niche than it is in almost all other fitness niches because the skill set required to deliver a incredible high intensity training, strength training workout to our target market, you got to be, you got to hit a certain bar, right? Yeah. Otherwise, um, you know, I guess you risk upsetting that client. Although I know some of our colleagues do a great job of saying, you know, this person's an apprentice or they might reduce the session rate for a time being or whatever. <laughs> But anyway, all of that said, what, well, what, what, what do you think that first four weeks look like? And maybe if we can just go into a little bit more detail for a trainer in our space, is it everything I touched on? And, and maybe you could elaborate on how specifically you might work on those skills you talked about there about turning skills into habits. Right. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of making sure that your people, as they come on board, really understand the culture and the, the kind of soft deliverables, if you will, of what we do, right? Every studio is a little bit different in their approach. And I think it really is important for you as an owner or manager to understand what that is and be able to articulate it, right? Whether it's writing it down, speaking it out loud, or all of the above. So also making sure that your current staff you know, I'm I'm a fan of making sure I have a lead teacher that can kind of co-coach the new employee with me, which doesn't mean I get to be completely hands off. I think it's important to check in, but being able to immerse that new staff member into the team itself, whether they're shadowing, whether they're um, being shadowed themselves, it's you know, as you say, the skill set that you would need for HIIT training is so specific that that's a big component of it. I think the soft and the understanding the equipment and the, the way that you train in your specific gym are the two most important components. Could you just elaborate again on what you specifically you mean by soft deliverables? Like what kind of things are we talking about there? So understanding the culture, being able to, the softer deliverables to me are being able to express to a client who comes in cold off the street, mm -hmm. every one of my staff should be able to walk over to that client if they're available and say, you know, welcome to Absolute Center. I have five questions I've developed that my staff knew where they could just begin to um, elicit from the client what it is that drew them in mm -hmm. before spitting out all the offerings, right? New trainers, they've looked at your services and they start to just spit out, oh, we have this, we have this, we have this, we have this. And the client's like, whoa, wait, I just wanted to come in and look around, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to really draw the client out so that you can find for them what the best approach is. That is, that takes a long time. And I feel it's important to understand the culture first while you're learning the the skills of manipulating the machines and working with clients. But that that sales ability, I think, has to be a mesh of the two of those. You cannot sell hit training unless you know what it feels like and you know how to dispense it. Right. Mm -hmm. The awesome. softer skills then to me are just being able to articulate all that in a way that sounds like you know what you're doing. You're not going, um, uh, maybe this will work for you. You're confident at it. So that's a soft skill that you have to hire for, you have to look for, and you have to compete or complete your training with, right? You have to just keep coaching that all the time. 
so that it melds with your specific business. Yeah. It's just fair to say, actually, or important to say that this is everything we talk about today is probably going to completely fall flat on its face if you don't get part one right, if you don't hire the right. right person for the right roles, which we talked about extensively in episode 469. So uh, obviously others. this is not yeah. a fix. This is not a fix for that if you get that wrong. Um, okay. And that's great. Thank you for just elaborating on that. So um, I guess the more kind of harder deliverables would be, like you say, running the training, working the machines, et cetera. That's a that's another challenging one actually in our space because um we would utilize shadowing or being shadowed, role play. Um Luke puts this really well. He he likens it to, you know, McDonald's University, you know, when yeah. they have the put the pickle on the burger, the pickle on the burger. And then that's a metaphor for, you know, perform a perfect rep on the pull down over and over again. Um I'm curious how you think about role playing that, if that's something that you've you've experienced with clients, coaching. Um, and how exactly you might go about that in terms of time allocation, you mentioned an hour a week, maybe it'd be more than that. I suspect if you've got someone who's, that's the primary thing they need to learn in the first couple of weeks or one of the oh, yeah. primary things. Um, I know that, sorry, that hour was more about that leader check-in. Sorry, it's just to be clear. Um, and how, so how you might, how you might role play that in practice, something like that and how, the format of that, I'd love to hear. Yeah. You know. In the Pilates world, there's a saying that the, the training just gets you the seat in the room. It's really the hours in the saddle that make you a proper trainer, right? And the same goes for, for our work for HIT Studios. So you come out, you've got your certification from, say, NASM or something like that. Now the real work begins to be able to dial in. And I believe it's a combination of observation of your more elite trainers, group work with other perhaps, you know, newer trainers or maybe a mix of all. And in that group, I'm a fan of, you know, let's go through the, the process of putting a client, a mock client through a workout. So they pair up, right? Meanwhile, mean person that I am, I'm running around and I'm interrupting them and I'm changing the vibe during the session to see how much control the trainer has over the session itself, over what's going on around him or her and how the client is reacting, right? So I also want to coach those pairs to kind of mess with each other, so to speak, be a recalcitrant client or be a client mm -hmm. that's you know, I don't know. I don't like this. I want to do this over here. I mean, we all have those kind of clients, right? Or they have a bad day. How does that trainer react to the situational deviation, so to speak, in a, in a typical session? I think that's really important. Can they keep their cool? Can they stay on track? You know, mm -hmm. how do they react to a client on the phone who calls in and says, Hey, that last workout was a mess. I didn't feel like I got what I just should have gotten, how do they react to that? You know, I want to try to give them as many problematic situations to suss out for themselves and give them the tools to be able to be successful at the completion of those problematic sessions, whether it's a call, whether it's a session itself, whether it's an angry client that got overcharged, anything like that. I want them to be able to think on their feet and be able to come out successfully, having get the, gotten the client to understand and uh, maybe calm down and buy back into your services. Yeah, excellent. That's very helpful. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. you know, yeah, what we always talk about is following them around too. while they're training their first clients, whether it's, hey, this is a junior teacher, so you're paying a little bit less, but I'm getting eyes on them. You know, in our studio, our clients knew they were always going to be watched somewhere because we were a training center. So there was always a more senior teacher or a manager or an owner, eyes on the session, either from afar or right on top of. And yeah. clients knew that and they appreciated it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So for those listening, you know, depending on how large your operation is, it's either going to be yourself as a business owner or a general manager at the location um, or a senior trainer, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, you, you mentioned there about doing the group work, which is a great idea. Um, you know, doing mock work, having client uh, trainers, um, 
behave as clients and present different challenges, being a recalcitrant client, for example. When, when that leader who's observing that group sees someone handle that mock session badly or make a mistake, how do you think about coaching in that moment, that individual? I'm a big fan of questions. Mm. So Lawrence, I saw you reacting to a client in this way. Can you tell me what brought that reaction on in you? And then you might respond, well, I got upset in the moment. Okay, that's great. How in the future can I help you to learn to modify that a little bit? So I'm not barking my commands at, at you. I'm not telling you what I think is best. I'm trying to get you to suss out for yourself. Okay, I did that incorrectly. How could I, because I'm a unique individual, approach that differently and successfully. And then you can mirror that back to me and I might make another suggestion or ask another question around it. That way, I believe you create some more accountability on the part of the trainer because they've come up with the solution, right? And it's not necessarily empowerment, so to speak, but they become accountable to themselves. They understand how their actions create, you know, real consequences. And I want to be able to have you self-monitor just like I want a client to. I don't want a client to mindlessly listen to me and go through a whole routine. I want them to understand how this work affects them, how they feel it in their body, how they feel the change. Same with a, with a trainer that I'm working with. Yeah, really. I think that's one of the most important things you said so far. Um, this is a, this was probably still is to an extent a massive weakness of mine. I was awful at this. I would be talking 80%, 90% as to what should have been done rather than letting the trainer figure it out. Um, so this is massive. And like you say, you could nip so many issues in the bud with this because you're teaching just like you do, like your, your metaphor using the client there, you're teaching the trainer to self-correct in an appropriate way for future uh, mistakes as well uh, and to start thinking in this way more like you say to start taking more accountability than always looking at you for the answers right um right. yeah that's so important okay so i think that all makes sense um and you know uh, again do, do you are you uh, do you like the idea of again if 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 training clients again in our, in our context like someone is going to come get hired by a high intensity training business and they've got an asm ace whatever but they won't have a clue. They will not know how to train clients in our particular approach or with our approach. So it is almost like they're going to be starting from blank slate. Right. Um, so I feel like that first four weeks is to be so heavily focused and biased toward, like you say, getting reps, getting experience, actually performing all the different aspects of our workouts and the different protocols and things like the sl a slow speed of movement or advanced techniques, isometric holes, all these things across different equipment. Do you, are you a fan of just breaking it all down much like yeah. I was suggesting there with Luke and then just, uh, and just repping that over and over again, spending hours and hours just practicing that in yeah. maybe a mock setting or other settings? Well, I think it, there's the classroom um, mm -hmm. stuff that needs to go on the why, why is this right. training here? Why was it brought about? How did it change? You know, if you don't know the why, you can't sell it. Um, same thing with really Pilates is the same way, right? We have to know the why. We have to know the history of it, the science of it. I think that's important. Then the actual movements themselves, I mean, you know, that's a little bit easier to ingrain, so to speak, if you're a mover. Um, yes, hours and hours. And breaking down the, how do I work with a beginning client? How do I work with a more advanced client? Why would I select these exercises and this type of movement in this specific order for this client? Um, how do I work around injuries? How do I work around different goals? How do I work with an elite athlete versus, you know, an older person or just a recreational athlete? This takes so much time. I mean, that initial four weeks is, if you're just coming off NASM and you don't have any other experience with HIT, again, that's just the seed in the room that first four weeks. Then the real work begins. 
So it takes longer for a newly minted certified trainer that doesn't know about HIT. It's going to take longer than four weeks, in my opinion, to get yep. them up to par, right? Um, yeah. Then we have to know how to manipulate the equipment, the different angles that we're looking at, the different speeds that we're looking at, the different loads, the, all of that. Um, if you don't understand the basic science behind it, I don't think you're going to be able to, to deal with it. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is it is vital to have that work in your body itself. This is where I feel that you create the coaching mechanism that you come up with the specific words that you can use because you feel it in your body that way, right? Do I, am I able to work with this client verbally? Do they need to see everything? Do they need to visualize everything? How are they at learning? All of those, um, those approaches that we have to take with different clients, you need to learn as well. That's something that they don't teach you in. Well, maybe they touch it on in, in ACE these days. I don't know. It's been a while since it. <laughs> no, I do. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. I think you're right. I think it is um, unrealistic to expect one to be able to do execute and all of this really well within four weeks. Um, I don't think most of the listeners would be um, would, would believe that. Um, and it's got me thinking. I know, again, this is pulling from from Discover Strength and... I believe the way they think about it is it's more about, okay, first four weeks is again, they want to get someone, you know, training clients ASAP, but they've got to be smart about it. So the, the first sort of, yeah, four weeks, maybe a bit longer is the essentials and they may even call it the essentials. So it's like, it's like, okay, we're not going to be able to cover every single, um, situation as it relates to injuries, all the protocols, all the different challenges. Cause obviously, you know, people have been training clients for lifetimes and are always learning. There's always something to learn, right? So it's like, okay, mm -hmm. what are the most common things that we see day to day and how we break that down into a training program to get someone up to speed as quickly as possible. So hence the essentials. Um, and so you're looking at, okay, what's the most common injury we see and then teach them how to deal with that. Or what's the, um, uh, most common protocol that we use, right. And start there perhaps in terms of that blueprint. Um, and then going a step further, you're really trying to, rather than give someone, okay, uh, again, I'm a big fan of getting, you know, asking trainers or having trainers to read books and, and upskill, right. In terms of enriching their understanding of how to deliver great training, but really what you're teaching in your uh, kind of your internal syllabus is your way. So you're like indoctrinating them in a style of training that is a good fit with your culture and your business before they are then experience enough where they can kind of start to be more authentic in themselves. They still follow your way, but they have more self-expression. But I think mm -hmm. in the beginning, you're not looking for self-expression. Yeah. You're looking for them to just make the hamburger. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, is that yeah. accurate? Do you have a problem with anything I just said? No, for sure. yeah. I just okay. had a conversation, not kidding you, on Sunday. Okay. A young guy that was here for dinner with us and amongst other people, but he was debating about going to PT school. And I said, why? And he said, well, because my friends are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, well, where does your real, there, there's the questions again, right? Where did your real desire live? And I could tell by looking at him, it's, it's working with people and improving their movement. And I'm, I said, forgive me for all the PTs out there. I said, you're not necessarily going to get that in PT school. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go, I am coded for a knee and that's all I can look at, right? If you want to look at the whole person and make them move better, you should be a trainer. And so we talked about how I said, you need to go through the protocols that you and I have spoken of uh, here. But once you get there and you, you have to develop the eye, right? I, I'm going to teach you all these things, but you've got to take the time and saddle to get it. And I said, what you need to do right now is go to work at a big gym that spits out a computer workout. You know, I put in 70 year old female wants to play tennis, whatever her goals are. It spits out a workout, put that workout on her, lather, rinse, repeat. So you just see how the work lands on them and how you develop your cues. Do that for a year, then come back. Then you're ready to go, okay, now I really need to, to upscale. So that's the kind of person I would picture someone like Luke or someone like me would hire 
in the fitness realm because I'm like, I want you to see how this different stuff lands on people before you even come in and talk to me about how to train in the method that I'm training or that mm -hmm. Discover Think Drink trains in, right? They've already developed their voice a little bit. They've developed an eye. They see what works on a client, what doesn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that four weeks can start. So if they're coming in cold off the street with their newly minted certification in hand, I'm going to have them do the same thing. You're going to work with your fellow team members. We're going to just do the same workout. You're going to see how it lands on Molly versus Ben versus Ralph and why it lands differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, great point. I, I, yeah, I mean, it, this is the other thing, isn't it? It's, um, you know, again, a lot of our colleagues in our space will take the hit uni certification, hit uni.com. It's, um, yeah, really right. great, uh, certification program specific again to high intensity training. Um, but even if you cram that in, you're looking at, I think you can probably do it in six, one of the courses I'm thinking of, the personal trainer course, probably can do it in six weeks if you really cram it in, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe shorter. Uh, I, I know it took me a few months. and But like you say, even if you have done that, it's not going to give you the skills um, that you require to actually train someone one-on-one. -on -one. You're only going to get that through doing, right? So, <laughs> so therefore, it does make sense to actually prioritize Okay, this is how we train a client. Like, forget. Okay, you, you mentioned it is very important to understand the why. You know, the you know how how uh, metabolic conditioning works, how build how muscles hypertrophy and build strength, all those things. Um, but it's like, okay, let's maybe prioritize. I'm just again, I'm just thinking about how do you fast track here. It's like let's prioritize like how we deliver the workout. What? How much why do we need just to underpin that? Just as a minimum. But mm -hmm. then, but so that you're ready to train a client, but do study the hit uni course in the background because you can be doing that in your own time. That's, you know, whatever. Um, right. I mean, maybe we're, assu I'm assuming here that most new trainers, we need to get, you know, if we want them to be started early, they're just going to have to really put the hours in. This isn't going to be a 40 hour work week. It's going to be right. a bit more than that. Um, and I guess that depends on your culture and, and uh, you know, the type of individual you want, how fast you want them to be ready as to whether that sits well with you, I guess. Um, Katie, this is great. So first four weeks, so just to step back a second, what we're talking about here is creating an onboard experience that maximizes the value of that person to your organization as quickly as possible, but exactly. going towards, but fosters that retention. I mean, for me, if I was hired into an organization and I had this plan for me, I'd be like, hell yeah, like this is professional. I feel confident. I feel comfortable. I feel like I'm taken care of, I feel like I'm being invested in. So what happens next? What are the, I mean, there's so many more, we're not going to get through all these, but maybe we can just get on because we spent so much time on that. We're going to have to do three. I don't know. Um, but what, what else, what are the key things for you that have to be addressed in a long-term career path that one maximizes value to business and maximizes trainer uh, satisfaction and retention? Yeah. So going back to our previous chat, we talked about laying out the different pay grades that you have in your organization and tying them to achievements that that trainer makes, whether it's additional certifications, um, actual hours at the, at the helm, you know, of working, um, client retention, those things. So I like to show people that as I'm bringing them on board. This is where you can go. Couple that with, you know, when I started this, at Gold's Gym, I was a bodybuilder and someone said, hey, you know, you look like you know what you're doing. Will you train me how to do back day for $5? Okay, great. That's how long I've been in this. But I didn't have any clue then that there was a trajectory that would take me where I am now or even further, right? Mm -hmm. So I do have those talks constantly with the people that um, I had in my studio working for me. And they saw what we were doing as owners. Like we were, we started out training dollar for hour when we opened the studio. Then we started to go out and teach workshops in our methodology. We taught our methodology within our studio. We went out and spoke at industry events. So they began to see that there was a greater place than just being a trainer. 
which I'm not taking away from. There's plenty of people that are happy just doing that for the rest of their lives. And that's great. But I want to, you know, kind of pull back the curtain and show my people where they can go with this work. Now, I will pause and say that doesn't necessarily always mean that they're going to do that with me, but I would rather have had someone that came up through my organization and left. And like we're experiencing now, the three of us honored, we've been closed four years. We still have teachers that tag us on Instagram and say, I wouldn't be here without Absolute Center or without Katie and Claudia and Louise. So that to me is leaving a legacy. And I, I want that. Now, keeping within the organization, we're upskilling all the time. You know, you're maybe having once a month or once every 12 weeks um, mentor hours where you're coming in and troubleshooting client issues. Those are free to the staff. You charge outside trainers to come to that. We are making sure we're encouraging them to go to industry events. So depending on their performance, we're providing them with money to pay for those industry convention to go to. Alongside that, we're working with them and coaching them to the next level. You know, this is great, Lawrence, you've gotten here. How can we get you up to that next pay grade? How can we get you to that next level? What do you need from us? to help you do that. Are you scared? Are you out of money? Do you just not want to? Or do you really want to, but don't know how? So that's my job as a leader to help coach you through that. I feel that all of those things coupled with, you know, the benefits and the perks that you offer are the things that keep your people on board. They want to know their value. They want to know that you see them. They want to know that you are communicating with them in a structured way, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or as a group, and that you're finding time every day to manage the team so that you're not fighting fires. You're using that time to make sure that those fires don't ever start. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great stuff. Um, yeah, and and just to sort of uh, add to that, it, and well, you kind of said it, but... It's making sure there's consistent one-to-ones or, you know, some people could talk about the, you know, the quarterly conversation dynamic. Um, but that's, that's a regular schedule that's adhered to because I think there's yeah. a lot of talk in businesses, but not a lot of action, right? There's a lot of, you know, ad hoc trainer or staff member walks into the leader's office, says, I need X, Y, and Z. They say, yeah, great. And then nothing happens. And there's a lack of accountability and just a lack of systems and, um, organization in the business to actually make sure that these things happen and having good and systems. I, I, would, yeah. I would interrupt you and say, if yeah. that trainer has taken the initiative to walk into your office, it's been in their head for a long time before they got the guts to walk in. Right. So I think that's way too long, right? I'm, I'm a fan of the weekly, just even five or 10 minute conversations, if you can do it or bi-weekly. And you've got to put in the calendar and you just have to do it and prioritize it. It's your responsibility. Sorry. That's, no, yeah. that's fine. That's really interesting. So yeah, what a great litmus test. If they come to you, it's like, oh, you probably messed up and not created an environment where that was extracted sooner, right? Yes. Through, like you said, a weekly meeting dynamic or what have you. Um, I love what you said there about they have to feel like they're being seen. Um, I remember, again, working with a trainer in our uh, strength training business where you know, I sat down with him in a coffee shop and we literally mapped out his goals. Like, okay, where, where do you want to be in five years, 10 years? What does that mean in terms of income? How do you want to spend your time? What do you enjoy? And like really mapped it out and then, and then mapped that against what we could provide through Optimo, the organization, and how we could contribute to that advancement towards that. And that's obviously huge, right? Because it makes the individual feel very heard. They're very invested in what you're doing. They, they feel like, you know, you're actually spotting them towards your goals. So just makes a lot of sense to do that, doesn't it? It's like, why yeah. would you want people in your organization who either don't want to be there or there's a complete misalignment between where they want to go and where you're taking them, right? It just doesn't make sense, yeah. does it? And, you know, that mapping out, Lawrence, is a way to, you know, one of the biggest fears in our business is, oh, I'm going to train this person up and they're going to take off and open their own place. Right. And when you're mapping that out and they see that you're helping them map that out and they see that it can happen, where they are right now, they're less apt to 
I need to go add hours working at Orange Theory or something like that, or I want to go up in my own place. And there was another thing that we did was we were an open book when it came to how our business was run, what the overhead was, that sort of thing. So not everyone's comfortable with that. We were. And yeah. everyone in our place knew what our rent was. It was $14,000 a month. And so they knew, like, there's a hustle, certain level of hustle that has to happen here in order to keep the doors open, right? And that was just the rent. That's not even the overhead and the salaries and all of that kind of stuff. So when you have that transparency, I think what it did for a couple of our staff was, holy cow, there's no way I'm going to go and into my own business there. I don't want to be paid for rent. Yeah. And there was also the, oh, I get it. Okay, we're all working this together. And we see these owners not rest, you know, we're not going to the beach on the weekends. I mean, we are, but not saying, hey, sorry, run this show by yourself. I'm out of here. We're in that trenches with them, you know, not overworking, but we've got them to um, help us spread the load off ourselves, right? Because that's the biggest thing that happens to us as owners, the I've got to do it all myself thing. And I feel um, when you're saying that, oh, I'll just do it myself, you're devaluating the people that work for you. You're making them feel like I'm not good enough to be able to do that. She's just grabbing it and doing that work instead of showing me how to do it or correcting me when I've done it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just chipping away at their egos a little bit every time you do that so yeah sure. great, great advice yeah like you got me thinking there so like uh, that's interesting like you can almost do two things to retain trainers more effectively one is as we've been talking about having these one-to-ones making sure that you really understand what they want where they're going and then design a plan in alignment with that um to help them to continue to grow in that direction but that, that is a common fear you said in, in high intensity training is uh, what if I ever pour my whole self into this person, they leave and set up shop. It's like, well, that's, a, that's actually another question. And that, and that's partly also, whilst you're absolutely, you know, it makes it sound like I disagree with you. I agree that obviously by having a plan and aligning that with the trainer's goals, they're going to be so much more likely to stay with you because that is not heard of. And they feel far more trust and, you know, want to be uh, part of your mission. Um, but and, but it's also important to have deterrence. So this is kind of a different topic, really, um, in terms of like, I don't know, we're still talking about trainer retention, aren't we? But it's like a deterrent could be, for example, that um, you've got it set up. And this is, I guess, an important thing that I think most of us try to set up in our hit business is set up in a way where trainers sorry clients work with multiple trainers rather than work with one mm -hmm. trainer yeah. so the clients are never a trainer's clients because obviously the fear is the trainer goes and then they take all those clients um so if you have a strong setup where you have clients training with multiple trainers that's far more far less likely to happen because they kind of enjoy that variation and also that scheduling flexibility that goes with that but then also if you then obviously bolt that onto radical transparency around financials like you just demonstrated oh look these machines cost this much each to to buy this to maintain the lease is x you need this software like this is how much it costs to run this business and this is kind of the upfront required like it makes it it creates more of a moat and sort of protects the business i think yeah. more effectively now you're always going to get some individuals who are just destined for entrepreneurship right yeah. it, that there's, that's we need that right we need those innovators and those people were always going to leave, regardless of what you did, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like you, uh, you kind of you were alluding to it earlier, it's like, don't have a scarcity mindset, have a kind of an abundance mindset and help them towards that. That's what they want. Yeah. Fine. Like, and maybe they'll buy your business. Maybe you're right. in sell it, right? Right, right. And look, there's, we all know not enough people strength train. So there's a, there is ample opportunity for everyone, it would seem. Mm -hmm. Um so that was perfect, Katie. Um, what else is there to add? So where are we? I'm just checking the time quickly. Okay, so got about 10 minutes here. So um, you talked there about understanding that that sort of long-term career advancement and how trainers can understand their incremental increase in compensation over time as they become more skilled or in terms of they could, like you say, maybe they become a very skilled trainer and there are rungs to that development or they move into middle management or a senior management team position, leadership position. 
Um, so you have kind of advancement to help them go whichever direction they want. So you want to build that, that growth plan, if you want to call it that out to do that. Right. Um, but are there other things that you think are really important? I mean, you kind of, um, gave a very high level overview talking about, you know, uh, perks and benefits. So are there specific things that you think trainers really expect? Maybe looking at trends right now, obviously in America, health insurance is pretty popular and important for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and. Never and, solved that problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously yeah, to, to not to digress too much, but obviously we yeah. have in, in England, you've got the NHS free healthcare, yeah. but it's still got enormous problems, huge sure, overwhelm. Sir. And that's the issue sure. with, with that, isn't it? Um, so yeah, what, what, what other things do you think are really important? Are there other kind of perks or benefits or fill in the blank that needs to be? Yeah. Put so on? I'm a, I have a really unique, um, list of benefits that are just kind of not hidden, but that people don't typically think of. So if anybody wants to reach out and DM me, DM me on um, Instagram at fitness HR, I'm happy to send that. It's about, um, I don't know, 18 unique benefit ideas. Cool. And it's everything, you know, we tried repeatedly, I think I said this before, to get health insurance for our staff, and it just was not feasible at all. But there are ways now, there's things like one medical where you could pay the premium for them and, you know, they can call and say, hey, I've got a problem. And while the the $90 a month that it costs you as an employer to pay for that, um, for their staff person, it doesn't cover exactly uh, visits, but it does cover conversations. So mm. it gets you in the door, so to speak. But there are other ideas around, if you look at your staff, and you have, let's say you have primarily a young staff in their 20s and 30s, or you've got, you know, maybe even your 40s that are super adventurous, you can get an experience aggregator that you offer. And that means you um, buy into this aggregator and they can experience things like slacklining or skydiving or wings, if you want to go crazy, or, <laughs> you know, anything adventurous like that. Conversely, if you've got an older staff, maybe they're looking at, I want to do some retirement planning or something like that. So you bring in a financial manager to show them this is what a 401k is. This is what a Roth IRA is, all the different, you know, investment vehicles that you have that are pre-tax. You can do things like discounts with fellow like businesses where you exchange. We exchange gift cards with um, actually down the street from, from us, another gym that did stuff that we didn't. We exchanged gift cards with a local restaurant so we could um, hand those out as perks. There's also a really unique thing that's happening in, in San Francisco with a lot of software companies is that the ownership is um, investing in a fund where staff can either nominate a fellow staff person that's done something amazing to get even a $25 coffee card or something because they achieved something in their career or they, a client cool. achieved something. So the staff can nominate, hey, we want Sally to have a gift card because she did X. There's also a fund where if Sally goes out on say she broke her leg doing something outside of the studio and she needs some extra help, that fund can help get her maybe some meals to come in while she's laid up, things like that. So there's all kinds of unique ideas that aren't super expensive, that aren't necessarily healthcare, that you can offer. And we talked about that total reward statement, I think, in our earlier discussion about here's your salary, Here's the perks that you get, you know, i.e. free membership at the gym, mentor hours that are worth this much. Mm. Um, you know, the the training that you get here should have a dollar value on it. The four weeks of, of training that you get have a dollar value. And then here's these additional perks that we offer or benefits that we offer. That way the trainers have a whole picture of it's not just that hourly rate or half hour rate that I get. It's all the other thing. I'm working with a, a, a hit studio down in Southern California and she's doing something similar. She's got, you know, if, as her people are going through hit uni, they're working in the studio, they're earning 
you know, an admin rate, but they're shadowing, they're learning the business. They're still getting the perks, even though they haven't been hired as a trainer quite yet until they're done with their training. So mm. there's all sorts of, you have to dig in and think, what are the different little pieces of value that I'm offering these, these trainers and how can I express that to them and show them the value of it? Right? Mm, that's so, so these are great points. That one yeah. there about, sorry, do I cut you off? No, go for it. Oh, that one there about, you know, articulating the value of the time spent onboarding them internally. Like I didn't think to do that. That's a really good idea. Um, and for those that are interested, uh, there is a really great PDF, um, courtesy again of uh, Discover Strength, which shows their actual, I mean, this has probably evolved since. Obviously now they're franchising, so it might be some, some change to it. Um, but it basically shows how they progress, how trainers progress through like a four tier system. And it's mm -hmm. got, like you were alluding to, it's got like, hey, you need to complete this many sessions and achieve this, these milestones, then you get access to all of this, like, you know, increased pay, increased opportunity, responsibility, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and it's very good just as a, 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 a kind of a framework to help you come up with your own. So obviously you've got to adapt this to your brand. Um, but anyway, if anyone wants to download that, again, you go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. And when you download that referral PDF, you'll get access to that uh, PDF with the four tiers and tons of other stuff as well. Um, Katie, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, so can we just do a quick summary together? Um, and I'm going to keep this really high level. So I guess the first thing to mention is that number one, what are we saying here? Onboarding stuff. Okay. So number one is really about thinking about this, the mindset, isn't it? For onboarding staff, it's, it's, you know, we, we have plans in place to onboard clients and then have, you know, a long-term plan in place to make sure that our client is, is making progress, is satisfied, is happy with their, their workouts, et cetera, is getting results. And we should have that for our employees. Right. Exactly. Um, same. Got to do it ahead of time. Right. So the reality is like many of us are not doing that and we're not have we don't have these plans in place for trainer onboarding and trainer long-term development. So think about your trainers just like you would your clients. The second part is is yeah, we really dug into that first four weeks. Like what do and the question I took out from what you said is what do they need to know? What does a yeah. trainer need to know and I guess be able to do in order to train clients as quickly as possible to a certain standard? I feel like that's the the key question to yeah, kind of inform the really steps. Yeah. On how, what the level the trainer comes in at, right? Have they yes. worked for another hit studio? Do they have all that stuff? Versus are they just newly minted going through hit uni, mm -hmm. you know, or somewhere in between? So there's a new door for every single one, so to speak. Right? Great point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess they might come in at a different level. And I guess even if someone has been training clients, they haven't been doing it in a hit style. Sometimes that can actually be difficult because you have to have them unlearn bad habits um, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, habits that don't align with your, your way in your business. Um, but no, I, I think, yeah, I think you make a good point there. So, um, and the way that looks obviously a mixture of soft deliverables and half deli deliver, sorry, hard deliverables and learning both of those client communication culture, but then also role playing the workout, the various aspects of delivering a good workout and um, shadowing and being shadowed by others as well and using a group dynamic, which you you know walked us through to make that more productive. Um, and yeah, and really it's having, and it's important to have a coach or a lead teacher around to monitor that and observe that, that yeah. process, right? And then give, and that you gave great advice there around coaching around, you know, don't tell them what to do or how to improve, ask better questions and help them come up with a solution themselves. Exactly. Uh, and provide that accountability. Because the other thing about that actually is if we, isn't there a whole thing? It's like, if you are, if you're trying to motivate anyone, you have to, you need to make it seem like it's their idea. And that yeah. sounds manipulative, but it, it's not like you're forcing them into it. You're giving them the opportunity to come up with an idea or a solution to a problem. And if I'm like, follow through on that, then they might your instructed solution, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And you know that we want that for our clients too. We want them to think about how they move when they're not in the in the gym as well, right? So we want our trainers to think about how they're training themselves while they're in that session, mm -hmm. not Katie told me to do it this way. Uh, no, I have to think about that and I have to plot it for myself and what works for me as a trainer and how I deliver. 
Yeah. And just to say as well, um, if you're interested, if you have, you're in a position where you have trainers or looking to hire trainers and you need onboarding blueprint, blueprints and templates inside Hit Business Membership, we've got whole playbooks on this stuff in terms of, again, a framework for where you can build that into your organization. Um, and that's over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash join. Uh, and then moving on to number three, it's, um, again, you mentioned it's about that long-term career advancement and then having clear steps that trainers need to work towards, um, and having uh, a, co a clear compensation incre increases at each step, but then aligning that with having good communication with the trainer, frequent one-to-ones, understanding their goals, making them feel seen and then adapting the plan to their uh, own goals, right? To, yeah, to what it yeah. is they want to get out of it and what they want to achieve. Um, and then you talked about there, you know, um, providing things like industry events and um, uh, having lots of opportunities to coach them up, right? In terms that might be certifications, things like Hit Uni, but also maybe internal development programs as well, helping them build a plan. Okay, okay here's the... Here's the different milestones, but then have a clear plan in place to reach each one yeah. of those, right? Don't just leave it to their devices to do it. Just point yeah. to them ever since. <laughs> right. Yeah. Great. Well said. Anything else on number three? Um, you know, just make sure that you're talking to them about their expectations, asking them about uh, accountability for their performance, you know, mm -hmm. looking at their the results that they have, providing feedback on there. So okay, as cool. they're going through it. Awesome. And then again, number four, I won't go through them all, but it's about understanding creative, potentially low cost ways to provide a lot of value to staff, right? Through different right. perks and schemes that you ran through. And please go to fitnesshr.com, contact Katie to get those yeah. 18 tips. Or just Sounds send like a good lead magnet Instagram. there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that a lead? Did you have that as like a PDF, like a downloadable thing for an email address? Yeah. Oh, very, yeah. very, very clever. Very good. Yeah. And 10. I love that. And then hiring mistakes as well. It's on there. Oh, perfect. Okay, awesome. All right, so go get those. Um, awesome, Katie. Thank you so much. This has been really valuable. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure there's also more we can cover in, in future episodes, but I still think this has been really <laughs> beneficial. Um, as because we yeah, that's the way it goes with these podcasts, isn't it? It's like we we dig into kind of one or two questions deeply. It's fun. Uh, and so for everyone listening to to connect with Katie, please go to fitnesshr.com. Um, and anything else, any sort of parting wisdom, Katie, as it relates to HR and looking after trainers, anything you think we've missed that you feel needs to be shared? No, I know, you know, there's going to be some eye rolling out there. Like, I don't have time to do this, but you don't have time to not do it. I mean, you will not get further if you don't really treat your people well and give them the tools to be successful in your business and to drive the revenue in your business. So. Take a Sunday, take a weekend, whatever it is to get this blueprint out of how to onboard your people. And don't be afraid to be the manager. Don't be afraid to be the leader. It takes time. It takes some skill building and then it becomes a habit and it's not so painful. Yeah. Great point. That's actually really key. We should, it's good that you, you remember to mention that because there might, might be a little bit of that. Um, and to everyone listening to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 472. It is 472, yep. Yeah. And until next time, thank you very much for listening as always. Hey, it's Lawrence again. Before you go, I have something special for those looking to accelerate their hit business. Would you like to know how to generate a flood of leads for free? Download our exclusive Builder Referral Machine Playbook. It's a concise guide packed with proven strategies from Luke Carlson, CEO of Discover Strength, a fast growing hit franchise. Clients in our hit business membership using these referral tactics have added 20 to 40 new clients, transforming their businesses dramatically. In this playbook, you'll uncover four dynamic referral tactics that you can implement right now to drive leads. Plus, when you download the guide, you'll gain access to invaluable resources to expand your business, like ready-to-use sales presentations, a guide for attracting top-notch trainers, a checklist for nailing your sales process, and so much more. And there's a bonus. Subscribe today to ensure you don't miss out on exclusive opportunities like live group calls of hit experts. Plus, you have the chance to contribute questions for our interactive Q&A blog posts and podcasts. 
where we directly address your queries with industry experts. These special events are scheduled periodically, and as a subscriber, you'll be the first to know when they happen. Just visit highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F, short for referrals, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, or click the link available where you're watching or listening to this, drop in your email, and you'll get instant access to all these resources today.